welcome to this webinar, Deeper Learning, Text-Dependent Analysis in the Classroom. And we're going to be focusing today especially on essays. I am Deb Rogge, a professional developer with ESU 8 in Neely, Nebraska. And all of the resources that I'm using today are available through the link that you find in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. You're welcome to use any of these with your students. They are non-copyrighted materials. Plus, also, if you want to share them with your colleagues, we really appreciate the fact that you do, are willing to do that. Today, we're going to be focusing on the Nebraska A-plus tenets of assessment and educator effectiveness. And with that, we'll begin our, our webinar. The learning goals for this webinar are to review what constitutes text dependent. And then we're also going to learn strategies to strengthen school student skills in those text dependent activities that you would have, uh, have or use in your instruction. We're going to understand the basic principles of text dependent analysis with multiple choice short answer, and full-length writings. Uh, at this time, I'd like to also share with you that there are specific other webinars that are available to you that are specific to sentence formation, uh, multiple choice, and short answer within the ESU8 uh, uh, YouTube page. So why text-dependent questions? Well, text-dependent questions make the learning visible. They keep it, the readers, in the text, not out of the text. What that means that if they have to go back into the text in order to find the answers to uh, the multiple choice, the short answer, or even the essay, they have to increase their concentration as they are reading that particular passage or passages and then they have to comprehend that, uh, that passage in a, at a hot, much higher level of acquisition, and which also forces them to be more cognitive about what they are reading and putting it into their long-term memory. Uh, keeping the readers into the text means that they're going to have to go back into the text to find the answers and not out of the text. Uh, out of the text means that they can call upon their previous learning experiences or personal experiences inside or outside of school in order to be able to answer the question uh, or the item or to be able to respond in an essay. Uh, when you keep the readers in the text, they have to go back in and dig, dig into that passage or passages and actually find the answer. In this manner, we are promoting deep thinking and critical examination of the reading that our students are doing. Now, this deep thinking and critical in, in examination uh, for this particular uh, webinar that we're doing, we're going to be using um, two short passages. But you may also use any other textbook that you have, uh, be it a science or a social studies or even a manual for putting something together in the technical side of their education or it's it's very you need we need to use text dependent questions in order to assure that our students are actually being able to get into the text that we're asking them to read rather than relying upon what they've known or or will know in the future in their personal lives so you're asking why does this matter to me well we have these goals for our students when we use text-dependent items, or we implement close reading, or we actually conduct a text-dependent analysis. In the moment, right very much right now, we want to make sure that our students have a deeper comprehension of the passage or passages that they're reading. We want them to have a deeper understanding of the structure of the modes of the various formats of reading that they will be reading, whether it's a personal narrative, an informative, a description, a persuasive, an argumentative. We want them to deeply understand that structure. 
then they, we want them to be able to write more deeply a response to the passage, which is presented to them in the in um, the format of either a text dependent question or a text dependent prompt. And then by learning those skills, they learn how to approach text in a different way rather than at the surface and at the surface value of that piece of text. And it gets them more deeply into the text. Plus, the revision of our Nebraska ELA College and Career Ready Standards in 2014 strongly dictates and strongly identifies that we need to be able to set our, our, our students need to be set up and learn how to be uh, stronger in text dependency um, when they're doing their writing. Because if they do that in the for now, in the future, then they'll be able to interact with the text that they come across uh, either in their, in their public school, their K-12 education, or uh, private school education, any kind of K-12 education, up and through their college and their higher degrees. Um, they'll be responding with comprehension to, uh, with confidence rather, to the comprehension items in the Nebraska State Assessment, or NESAS, as well. Um, let's look at some examples and some non-examples of text-dependent um, items. Um, on the left on this screen, across this light blue bar, you'll see that the, the uh, non, not dependent uh, item is on the left or the text-dependent item is on the right. Let's look at those closely. Um, the not text-dependent says, give three examples of how animals sleep in different ways. Okay, we all can answer from our prior knowledge uh, how sleep animals may sleep and how they sleep in different ways. We know that some sleep in um, open trees, some sleep in burrows, some sleep in just various ways by simply having an experience in life with either watching uh, television or, or reading a book or maybe they even go out and um, they actually look within the fields and the forests that are around them and actually see how animals sleep. But when we look at the text dependent analysis item on the right, it specifically says this. It says both pal passages tell us about ways that different animals sleep in the wild. Explain how animals sleep in different ways. Write a well-organized response using specific evidence from both passages to support your answer. Okay, now right now, the very first sentence tells us that both passages tell about different ways animals sleep in the wild. Then the student is given the task to explain why animals sleep in different ways. And the third sentence tells them that they have to organize that response and they have to go back into the text to be able to find specific evidence from both of the passages that they read in order to support their answers that they give as to, to telling about different ways that animals sleep in the wild. In other words, they have to go in and, and um, cite evidence from the passages that, uh, or even paraphrase, uh, paraphrase evidence from the passages to explain why animals sleep in different ways. It's a whole different um, idea when we're looking at text dependent because we're going back into the text and we're not coming uh, from our own experiences outside of the text. So when we look at this next item, it the non-text dependent item says identify the literary devices the author uses in the story. Provide evidence from the story in your response. Now this example, non-TDA example, does ask us to identify literary devices and it does ask us to provide evidence from the story in our response. But we could list many, many, many different types of literary devices and uh, only provide evidence from the story for a few of those or a select, uh, selected group of those. So if we look at the text dependent analysis item on the right, mood is the is the feeling or emotion that a reader experiences from a poem or a story. 
Explain how the poet's word choice helps create mood throughout the poem. Write a well-organized response using specific evidence from the poem to support your answer. So in the text dependent item, they have isolated or identified specifically the literary device of mood. And they ask for you to explain from this piece of poetry that you obviously read because it talks about the poet's word choice, it wants you to tell, explain how the poet's word, poet's word choice helps create mood throughout the poem. And then again, we have that same sentence that we had from up above. Write a well-organized response using specific evidence from the poem to support your answer. So we're going to go back into the phone, poet, poem to find the poet's word choice that created mood. And we're going to cite it, we're going to re uh, present our evidence, and then we're going to support our evidence within, uh, within the passage or the poem that we just read. So you find here that it's, there is a difference, whereas on the right, we are very specific about we're looking for mood. We're over on the left example, the non-TDA example. We're just identifying literary devices and looking for them within the, the passage that uh, the, the, the story that we read. All right. We're going to talk specifically from here on out in this webinar about the TDA essay. Uh, one of the tools that we use in the TDA uh, essay is the NDA TDA rubric. This is a um, photograph or a desktop picture of the Nebraska Department of Education text dependence analysis scoring rubric. Notice that uh, in the watermark underneath it says draft. Um, this particular rubric was adopted on August 2nd of 2016 and will be used this year in order to determine uh, the scoring level, the holistic scoring level of uh, student performance in grades 5 through 8. This rubric will remain in draft form until um, Uh, range finding has been completed on the samples of students who write uh, on the 2017 uh, English Language Arts ESA assessment. And then once uh, it has been validated um, and we find that this rubric holds true to the performance levels of our students, then the word draft will come off of this particular rubric. But for right now, we are working with a draft form of uh, the rubric. Then another important thing that we need to uh, consider is the characteristics of a text-dependent analysis essay. Uh, this particular resource and the um, rubric are available for you on the resources page that I shared over the link in the on the title uh, that it was right right available in the lower right hand corner um, the characteristics are that it provides evidence from the text which can only answer the prompt by referring back to the text so there here again we come into that into the text not out of the text the second bullet says that we need to emphasize the use of explicit and implicit information from the text to support reasoning and analysis Explicit means that it's right there in the text. It's evident. It's written. It's, it's right within the, the passage that you're reading. Implicit means that there are things that you can imply based upon what's written within the text. So you need to support your reasoning and your analysis with both of those uh, two qualities of explicit and implicit information. Then uh, a TDA essay also draws inferences based on what the text says in order to support the analysis. That goes along with the explicit and implicit information usage. So you have to draw those inferences. You use um, precise language when you're writing your essay. 
and a variety of sentences uh, can be found within this, the, the paragraphs and the structures of the essay. Um, we always use transition words in order to move the reader through the reading and cause the reader to shift to either your next idea or your next paragraph or whatever uh, function that transition uh, plays within your piece. Uh, it does not include the writer's comments or opinions unless you're specifically asked to do so in the prompt. Um, keep the word I out of your writing. Write always from another perspective rather than your own personal perspective. Uh, paraphrases, um, you want to make sure that you seldom copy text directly from the passage. Paraphrasing is a very strong skill for the writer to have. Um, if you do use text and it's copied directly from the passage, it is as words, phrases, or sentences used to support uh, or identify a claim that you've made. In other words, it has a specific purpose. It's just not a listing within, but you weave it very skillfully into the claims that you're making in order to support your position or your, um, or your uh, idea of, uh, about explaining or analyzing uh, the passage. And you use structure, which includes a very clear introduction, body, and a conclusion. It's very important that that structure be within there. Does that mean that it has to be three paragraphs or five paragraphs? Not necessarily, but the structure needs to be there so that the reader can very uh, specifically identify where they are within the particular passage uh, that you have written, the essay that you've written, so that everything is in, in uh, harmony. Um, down at the bottom of this sheet, uh, we've done some specific uh, definitions uh, that evidence means to be or show evidence of. And explicit means state clearly and in detail, leaving no room for confusion or a doubt. You have to be explicit about that. And then to defy, define implicit, uh, it's implied though not plainly expressed. In other words, you imply something, you make a, a, a connection which has um, a tie to your claim but it is more of a, uh, it's a, it's a version of what you believe and what the, the writer believes, not what you believe, more what the writer believes. So then you have the inference, which is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reading. So we have to make sure that we infer. And then the analysis is a detailed examination of the elements or structure of something, typically as a basis for discussion or interpretation. So this is one of the documents you'll want to share and discuss thoroughly with your students. And then also um, the text-dependent rubric you'll want to share with them. Um, next, within our webinar, we're going to go a little more deeply in the explanation of the uh, Nebraska text-dependent analysis scoring rubric. First of all, I want you to notice that this rubric is divided into four levels of performance. Um, these levels of performance are performance of a level one. Uh, the, we're going to go across the black bar. Means that it tells us that a student demonstrates minimal anal analysis of text, uh, use of evidence, and writing skills. Notice that the word minimal is boxed and highlighted in yellow. That's the key factor for a level one performance. It's minimal. Then when we look at a level two performance, um, it changes just, uh, it changes. And it says that a, the definition of a level two, it says demonstrates partially effective analysis of text, use of evidence, and writing skills. So it's partially effective for a level two performance. A level three performance states that it uh, the, the piece demonstrates effective analysis of text, 
use of evidence and writing skills. Notice that the descriptor changed to effective. So when we look at a level four performance, a level four performance being the highest level of performance, it demonstrates an exemplary uh, analysis of text, use of evidence, and writing skills. So when we look at these uh, levels of performance, they go from minimal to partially effective to effective to exemplary in their ratings of level of success uh, scoring. Also, we have three different domains that we look at. The first domain that we're going to examine uh, is analysis of the text. Uh, notice that as we move from left to right across, analysis of text has each level of performance have three indicators within that. Those indicators, as we move uh, across, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more, build upon each other. The second domain is use of evidence. Uh, notice here that there are three indicators uh, at each level of performance again. And then we get into the writing skills of the student. Notice that if within writing skills, there are four bullets, uh, four indicators of uh, what it looks like at each of the four levels of performance. Now, let's go back into analysis of text. And we're going to move across analysis of text, looking at each level and identifying the specific indicators uh, and the uh, language, the descriptive language that is used in order to be able to describe the, that level's level of performance. When we look at uh, analysis of text uh, at a level one, notice that in bullet one it says minimally addresses parts of the text. Uh, bullet two demonstrates minimal understanding of the text or texts and it is ineffectively analyzes explicit and or implicit ideas in the text, ineffectively. So we have minimal, minimal, and effectively all under a level one. When we move to the right to a level two performance, remember a level two performance is partially effective. Uh, the first bullet says it addresses some parts of the task. The second bullet says it demonstrates partial understanding of the text. And the third bullet says that it partially analyzes explicit and or implicit ideas from the text. It only partially analyzes. So when we look at effective, um, we looked at a level three and we see that it addresses all parts of the task, demonstrates uh, understanding of the text and it analyzes explicit and implicit ideas from the text. So it analyzes changes where they actually have done the analysis that's required of them of explicit and implicit. Um, when we look at a level four performance and exemplary, notice that uh, our descriptor words are thoroughly addresses all part of the task demonstrates thorough understanding of the text and thoroughly analyzes explicit and implicit ideas from the text. So it's very thorough. So as we move across, we can see where, uh, where the experience when you're analyzing the text of the student becomes uh, from a level one to a level four, it becomes uh, stronger and stronger all the time. It's more evident every time we, we actually see it at a different level of performance. But we have to keep in mind these highlighted words. They are the key words that help us to identify the performance level of a student. So let's go through and let's look at use of evidence. So when we look at a level one, it, it minimally uh, integrates evidence. Uh, uses few details, examples, or quotes. Uh, it provides little or no relevance or accurate evidence. 
from the tax not to even support their analysis. It has ineffective use of paraphrases or quotes that attribute to the uh, information on the t in, within the text. It, now when we look at a level two, notice again, we have the descriptor words of partial in the, the first and third bullet, and we have some in the uh, second bullet. Uh, so it partially integrates evidence from the text by using some detail, examples, and or quotes, and it provides some relevant and or accurate evidence from the text to partially support uh, the analysis. Uh, again, it partially is effective use of paraphrasing or quotes that attribute information to the text. So we, we it's just partially effective. And it only uses some relevant. Okay, let's look at a level three. Here, uh, it integrates specific evidence from the text by using details, examples, and quotes. It's specific evidence. Then the second bullet said that it provides relevant and accurate evidence from the text to support that analysis. And the last bullet says it uses paraphrases or quotes that attribute information to the text so that it is effective. And then naturally when we look at our level four exemplary uh, analysis uh, level of performance, it skillfully integrates specific evidence from the text by using details, examples, and quotes. And it provides relevant and accurate evidence from the text to thoroughly support that analysis, and that it skillfully uses paraphrases or quotes that attribute information to the text. The third domain and that we're going to uh, examine more closely on the rubric is that of the writing skills. So remember, a level one, you have minimal analysis of the text, use of evidence, and the writing skills, so minimal writing skills. So we look here that it generates a minimal focus in response, which lacks an introduction or thesis, body conclusion, and or transitions. Remember in our characteristics, we talked about introduction, body, and conclusion, and it also mentioned the importance of transitions. They ineffectively demonstrate an organizational pattern in our mode, mode suited to the task. In other words, they really they are minimally uh, using their writing skills effectively. The next third bullet says that they minimally use precise word choice and or content specific vocabulary from the text. In other words, they write from their own experiences, they write out of the text rather than in to the text using the text as their point of evidence and then they uh, ineffectively demonstrate the conventions of standard English which are include uh, spelling punctuation grammar all of those kinds of things and the errors that they make may seriously interfere with the meaning if you have to go back and read over and over again in order to even try to get any flow within that particular piece why you have ineffectively demonstrated uh, in the writing skills. So let's look at a partially effective. Here they, remember they used the word partially, so it partially generates a focus with a, a partially effective introduction thesis body and or transitions. They partially demonstrate an organization pattern or a mode suited to the task. Occasionally, they use precise words, um, uh, precise word choice, and or content-specific vocabulary from the text. Occasionally, uh, they partially demonstrate their conventions of standard English, and you may have errors that uh, which interfere with the meaning. Uh, it causes you to have to again probably either reread over or try to make sense of what's going on. So when we talk about the writing skills at a level three, they are effective. Uh, they generate a focused response with a clear introduction, a thesis body conclusion and transitions. They demonstrate an appropriate organizational pattern and mode 
that's suited to the task. They use precise word choice and content-specific vocabulary from the text. And they demonstrate uh, demonstrates conventions of standard English. And if there are errors present, they seldom interfere with the meaning. In other words, you can move right along. For instance, if a uh, student um, meant or the text called for them to use the word women, but they always use the form woman, why it if you can still understand that that's what the student intended, that it intended rather than being woman to be women, why it doesn't interfere with your uh, meaning or the content of their piece. Now, when we look at a level four, we always want to make sure that that's an exemplary anal analysis uh, of their writing skills. In other words, they generate a well-focused response with a purposeful introduction, thesis, body, conclusion, and transitions. They skillfully demonstrate an appropriate organizational pattern and mode suited to the task. Again, they're skillfully using word choice, actually precise word choice, and content-specific vocabulary from the text to enhance their ideas. And they thoroughly demonstrate conventions of standard English. And if there are errors that are present, they don't interfere with the meaning at all. There's no cause to be concerned about that. So, having looked at the rubric and all of the, the uh, innuances of the rubric that we need to be uh, thinking about as we're working with our students and as we're looking at student pieces of work, there is a specific pattern we want to use when we're answering a uh, text appended essays. Um, this little five step protocol right here helps us to form our answer or formulate our answer and get ready to move into actually composing it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we always need to read the prompt. Uh, and then we, as we, after we've read that, we need to ask ourselves, did it ask me to explain or analyze? Uh, which is part of uh, step two. Uh, you may need to write that down. Is it asking us to explain or analyze? Then we need to locate the evidence in the text that can be used in answering the question or the prompt. We want to be able to underline it or on a piece of scratch paper, specifically list that evidence that we're either going to explain or analyze. Then we go about the idea of completing the answer. In other words, writing our um, introduction, our body, and our conclusion or, um, so that we incorporate the evidence in our answer that we found in step three. And then we want to make sure that we indicate the source of our evidence that we have. Um, finally, we want to reread and fix up our answer. In other words, we want to use revision. Does your answer answer the question or does it make sense? Or and or our skills in editing. We want to check for spelling, punctuation, and capitalization. I'm going to be taking you through step by step of this protocol, and we're going to be uh, actually writing and looking at some student work. This is our prompt that step number one told us that we need to read. So Adventurous Storyteller provides uh, biographical information about Jack London, the author of The Call of the Wild. Explain how London's life influenced his writing. Write a well-organized structured response using specific evidence from both passages to, to support your answer. So that is our question or our prompt. Now notice this word, the second step asked you to determine, are you to explain or analyze? Highlighted here and in bold, we have the word explain. So we need to understand or we need to have a relationship with the term explain so that we're able to um, complete our answer. So if we unpack the verb explain, it tells us 
in, means to us that when a prompt asks you to explain, it's asking you to do one or two things. It's asking you to give details about it, whatever the prompt is asking you, or it, it's asking you to describe it so that it can be understood. So if we look at this, it wants us to explain how London's life influenced his writing. So are we going to give details about it or, that, or are we going to describe it so that it can be understood? One of the things to remember if the verb explain is within your prompt, you often tell why or how it occurs. So why is when you give the details about it and how it occurs describes it so that it can be understood. Now, all of the prompts are either going to use the verb explain, which we've just gone through in great detail, or it's going to ask us to you, it's going to ask us to analyze. Analyze is asking you when you're within a prompt to divide the whole into its parts or its elements. In other words, how does it come apart and, and what it's asking you to do? What are the pieces and parts? And then it's asking you to look in depth at each one of those parts. So when you divide it into its parts and look in depth at those parts, then you need to use supportive arguments and evidence for and against and on those particular parts. You need to be able to uh, uh, support or unsupport, dis dis support uh, the, the element, the parts or elements. And then you need to show how the parts interrelate to each other. In other words, how do you weave it together so that when you've divided the whole into its parts, you've looked at it in depth, you've written, you used supporting arguments and evidence, how do you show that those parts relate to each other? In other words, how does it stick together? You'll be just, it's, it's to analyze in my estimation is just a little bit harder because you have to tie that all together. So this is the text-dependent analysis prompt that I just read to you a little bit earlier. Now, I broke the three sentences down so that you can look at this at a more uh, specific level. Now, the first sentence um, introduces us to our topic and who we're going to be asked to be thinking about because it says Adventurous Storyteller, which is the name of our particular passages, provides biographical information about Jack London, the author of Paul of the, Wild, of the Wild. Now, the next sentence within the prompt tells us what we have to do. And what we have to do, again, in bold print, is explain. We just talked about explain and how it, uh, what we have to do when we explain. Now remember, when we explain, we have to give details about it or we have to describe it so that it can be understood. You have to tell the why or the how it occurs. So we are going to have to tell the how or the why London's life influenced his writing. The last sentence within the prompt tells us what, our, what we have to do. We have to write a well-organized, structured response using specific evidence from both passages to support our answer. Now, right away, notice that both is in uh, all caps. So we know that when we read as Adventure Storyteller, we are going to have to read two passages before we begin our writing so that we can better uh, explain what's happening. Now, also down here, uh, Again, we have the Nebraska TDA rubric available to you, but right here is what is a TDA think sheet. And let me share that think sheet with you. 
Um, this think sheet right now is a graphic organizer which uh, allows your students to be able to um, structure their response. So when we're out looking at this, the topic that they're going to have, the topic that they're going to have is that they're going to have to um, uh, explain how uh, London's life influenced his writing. The audience that they're going to write to in this particular case will be the uh, the readers of theirs uh, or the scores or whoever is reading this particular piece. Now the purpose right now it's written here you have to write this down in your uh, is it to analyze or is it to explain and um, I'm sorry, but explain is not out here. I'll make sure that gets to be a part of that. So this particular section right here uh, assists your students with their introduction. So they would write there, they would restate the question, they would uh, identify what the main idea is or ideas that they're going to uh, actually use within their passage that they're writing, their writing uh, essay. And then here, they would preview the parts that they're going to use. Because in the body, this particular graphic organizer talks about using three different uh, parts that you use in order to be able to support your, um, your explanation of uh, London's life, how it was influenced his writing. So we would identify those in each of these. Then here uh, is where we write our ideas for our specific conclusion of uh, how we would use this. Now, this is a uh, another uh, for another reading, but a, uh, a filled out one so that you could get an idea as to how it might look when you actually are filling uh, filling out this particular graphic organizer. Uh, one of the things that we really appreciate about, about this particular uh, fixed think sheet for text dependent analysis is the fact that um, when you're in a testing situation you could give a blank sheet of paper to your students and they could uh, draw this out and they could actually fill it in uh, because remember when we're going through the steps of this one of our steps was for us to highlight or list uh, the important evidence that we're going to have to uh, put in, and those could be listed within those boxes. And that's exactly what you see in each one of um, these, because their first part is that it's a threat to the health, and then here are all their evidences that they drew, out, or they went into the text to find and drew out, and then we find that part, the next part of their essay will talk about inform uh, con the consumers and their evidence and the responsibility of the government and then their evidence. So if this particular uh, graphic organizer works for you and your students, why uh, it's just an offering, it's something to help you help you understand how that actually all comes together. Then this other piece that I have right here are the uh, text dependent prompt guidelines. Um, these were pulled from the Department of Education, but it all, it tells uh, exactly what uh, requires student to do and what the format will be on the analysis and how the prompts were, uh, guidelines were taken and uh, how they actually fall in together and how they actually work with and down here, it tells us about uh, what what uh, English language arts standards are going to be assessed. Uh, so that helps. And then here are two uh, the two that I shared with you, plus a third one uh, of a non-text dependent analysis item, and then a text dependent analysis item. These are just tools you can use with your students and to help yourself become more familiar. Okay, let's look at a level three example of uh, the prompt 
that we have been working with. Remember that the prompt says that Adventures, Adventure Storyteller provides biographical information about Jack London, the author of The Call of the Wild. Explain how London's life influenced, influenced his writing. Write a well-organized, structured response using specific evidence from both passages to support your answer. Now, this is a level three example. Now, remember, a level three example, um, the student had, let's go back. Let's go back to the rubric. Okay, uh, a level three example that demonstrate effective analysis of the text uh, and use of evidence and the writing skills. So let's go back here and let's read, I'll read this aloud to you. Jack London's books and articles are still read today, but he wrote The Call of the Wild in 1903. At the time, he was the best-selling and highest paid author of the day. People still read his work because he was an adventurous storyteller. Jack London used his life experiences to influence his writing. London grew up by the ocean in California, and at a young age he began sailing. He even sailed to Japan on a schooner. London loved to read, and he spent many hours at the public library educating himself. But he found college to be boring, not lively enough, so he left after just six months. But he worked at many jobs and gained a first-hand experience of working people's lives and, uh, and all the hard work they did. This is where he got his ideas to write his adventure tales from. London went to Alaska in 1897 during the Klondike Gold Rush. It was hard work and he did not strike it rich, but he found that he could entertain the miners with his stories much better than he could find gold. He learned he could be a great storyteller instead. Because of his experience in Alaska, he was able to write many more stories of his adventures during that time. The Call of the Wild is one of his best books and is based on his Gold Rush experience. I know this because he mentions yellow metal and he talks about how cold it is, so he's probably writing about his time in Alaska. London writes about ships in the book too. I don't think you could write stories about sailing if you hadn't sailed before. Snow is mentioned in The Call of the Wild, and it seems like London is describing his first encounter with snow, just like Buck did in the story. London also knew about the dogs that were used, and the must have learned this from his real life in Alaska. Overall, Jack London's experiences in life especially in the Alaskan Gold Rush, really helped him tell his story vividly. His determination in life helped him become a writer, and his experiences in Alaska helped him to give all the detail needed to the reader so they feel they had been to Alaska too. Now remember, this is a level three example. Now the next slide I'm going to show you is uh, a slide that gives an analysis of the response, of the level three response. Now, let me just read this response to you. This response demonstrates an effective analysis of text, use of evidence, and writing skills. The response addresses all parts of the task of explaining how London's life influenced his writing. Specific relevant analysis and text-supported evidence is support is evident. The response is focused on the early bi biography of London's life and his experiences during the Alaska Gold Rush. A clear and appropriate organizational pattern is evident. The response includes precise word choice and context-specific vocabulary from the texts, as well as a clear use of paraphrases and quotes, attributing information to the text. Conventions of standard English are demonstrated, and errors when present seldom interfere with the meaning. Okay, let's debrief this particular analysis right here. When we look, 
here, it's an effective analysis. Now remember, when you're looking, the key word at a level three performance is an effective. Effective. That it addresses all parts of the task. It provides a specific, relevant access, and text support is evident. The, the, there's a focused response. Uh, focusing on the early biography of Lundy's life and his experiences at the Gold Rush. There is a clear and appropriate organizational pattern. The response includes precise words and content-specific vocabulary, as well as uses clear use of paraphrasing and quotes, which attributes all of that back to the information in the text. Conventions are demonstrated, and errors seldom interfere with the meaning. So you can see that if we go back, to our rubric, when we look at this effective analysis, all or many or most of these qualities are found in that particular piece of writing. And so it was scored at a level three. Okay, let's go back to a level two performance and let me read that one to you. Jack London's life played a big part in influencing his writing. He loved to read, and he spent many hours in his youth reading at the public library. He probably learned quite a bit about how to write by doing all that reading. He tried college for six months, but found it too boring and quit. Instead, he started writing stories about some of the jobs he had. A sailor, rancher, railroad, hobo, and gold prospector. He could relate to working people because he was one of them. One of his jobs took him to Alaska to look for gold. London found out that he could make up stories, and people actually liked listening to them, even though the gold prospecting didn't pan out. He did use his experiences during the gold rush to write many stories, including The Call of the Wild, which takes place in the Alaskan wilderness. Part of Call of the Wild takes place on a boat, and Jack London used to sail. He even sailed to Japan. With all his experiences, it makes sense that Jack London could, would go on to be a famous writer. I'm going to take you a little bit differently this time. Let's go back and let's look at this rubric. Now, this was scored as a level two performance because it was found to be partial effect, partially effective. Now remember, these are the qualities that we're looking for. So if we go back to our passage, that this is a level two example. This is the analysis that was offered to explain uh, the rationale for scoring this at a level two. Um, you find that it's partially effective on the analysis of text, use of evidence, and writing skills. Write down a level two. Partially addresses the task. Partial analysis. Um, and text support for the central idea. Insufficient, relevant evidence from the text. Um, they needed to have more examples and details in order to achieve a higher score. They were just very general and very um, um, general. What I mean by general is they, were, they paraphrased a lot of it rather than actually pulling it directly from the text. Uh, there's a weak introduction. In fact, the whole piece is written as one paragraph rather than as um, uh, a specific introduction, body, and conclusion. Um, uh, they didn't cite 
the quotations appropriately. They didn't use such phrasing as in acid or uh, um, the text shares, the author shares, those kinds of things. So it would make it a little bit more uh, appropriately cited and more strong rather than because they inferred that we understood it came from the passage. Um, uh, the errors occasionally interfered with this. I just found that it was uh, stumbling, it was hard. I couldn't just go ahead and continue to read and still maintain um, the, um, the meaning of the passage. So here we have, remember, um, this is our level two, uh, ex our level two example. Uh, and I encourage you to show and share these, these examples with your students. Uh, it doesn't make any difference that this is written at a seventh grade level. That is not the important part of it. The important part is that it is an example of student writing at the level two. And also, I would not hesitate at any time to use the level three example uh, as where we need to hit the targets. Now, um, you can uh, examine and use with your students the level four and the level one example uh, by accessing um, this sampler that's right here. It's totally on the resource page that's available to you. And uh, I highly encourage you to go ahead and tap into that resource. Another resource that's on the resource page that I want to draw your attention to, but there is not a direct link at this time to, on this webinar, would be a um, uh, transitions uh, listing of various transitions in order to be able to use. It's a good thing for your students to have that page so they can familiarize them with them. And also there's another handout there that's about citing evidence and various ways to introduce or weave that into your, uh, your essay. Well, I want to thank you for being a part and taking a part of this essay and listening to uh, what I have to share with you. Uh, I thank you very much and I wish uh, for you the most um, profitable uh, instruction in text dependent writing and especially with writing essays with your students. And you know what? I went through all of that and I never recorded it. Son of a gun. Well, that was a fun. Okay. 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 Okay.